the third much harder test administered to these fifth graders. Now keep in mind, they haven't been issued additional praise after that first test. This test is two grade levels harder or two grade levels higher than the test subjects and the smart kids did not do well. And not only did they not do well, they languished, they acted depressed, they assumed they weren't smart after all because they'd finally, they'd, they'd come up against a task that was hard and they gave up. The other group of kids, the ones who were told you must have worked hard, looked at this test and thought, I must not have worked hard enough. In fact, many of them, unprovoked, said, this was my favorite test. And after the test was over, they started looking at the kinds of problems that were on the test, researching them, fifth graders researching things, trying to figure out how to get a better grade on that test. They wanted to take it again. The one sentence of praise, ad admittedly administered to a formative young mind, made that kind of a difference in their approach to the material. Last slide. Let's talk about what uh, unconscionable crime has been committed upon these poor uh, fifth graders. The fourth and final test, essentially the same as the first one. The you must be smart kids performed 20% worse than they did the first time. Oops. And the you must have worked hard performed 30% better than they did the first time. Wow. Now, this, when, when my wife and I read this article, uh, she read it. Somebody linked it to her. It, internet, that's how these things work these days. Somebody sent it to her. She read it. She passed it to me. I read it. And we changed the way we parent because we realized, well, we got young kids. I'm not, I'm going to stop telling them, you know, my dad was smart. I'm smart. You're smart. You can do this. Not motivational. Next slide. Uh, what we just learned, the obvious, praise your children for their efforts, not their abilities. Any of you have children? Okay, I encourage you, if you haven't already read this study, the study's in the bibliography, the bibliography will be on the website, go read the article and, and maybe make some changes to, to how you talk to your kids. Believing that a task requires innate ability or talent provokes failure. Believing that the same task instead requires hard work provokes success. The difference, you can control how hard you work, you cannot control how talented you are. How many of you feel talented? Anybody feel talented? Oh, come on, you gotta be good at something. All right, how many of you feel like, or, or have had an, a, a situation where you've done something and somebody has said, oh, yeah, you, you really don't have much talent at this. Any of you ever done that, been there? Oh, that sucks. That is so awful. Remember that picture of Schlock? Okay, if somebody had looked at that and said, boy, don't quit your day job, and I had listened, because they did say that, um, <laughs> what a different life I'd be leading right now. If you believe you are in control of whether you succeed or fail, you are more likely to succeed. Now, I am not making the motivational speaker rounds telling people, if you believe it, you can do it, because that's a lie. What I'm telling you is, statistically speaking, if you believe that hard work makes a difference, you are more likely to succeed than if you believe you just have to be talented. You see the difference between the two? There's the, the reality over here backed up by statistics, because you know, we all know that statistics never lie, and then the motivational speaker angle. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. Back to the hard work thing. I had to do some research to find this quote because I've been quoting this for a while. You've got to write a million words, perhaps more, before you get down your first true word from author Henry Miller. David Gerald quoted him a number of times, uh, or quoted him in a, in a book, and gets quoted a lot in the genre fiction industry. Uh, your first million words are for practice. They don't count. My friend Bob Defendi went to the Writers of the Future. He won the Writers of the Future contest a while back. and. Uh, went out there and somebody quoted David Gerald and then added this bit to the end. If you get paid for some of your first million words, go ahead and start practicing cashing the checks, which we think is just hilarious. You know, yes, it's practice. If you can get paid for your practice, beautiful, brilliant. Take the money and run away fast. 
before they figure out that you haven't written your first true word yet. Elantris was not Brandon. How many of you know Brandon Sanderson? No, of Brandon Sanderson. Okay. I know him. I'm due to go to the gym with him today. That's my brush with fame, my name dropping. Elantris was not his first novel. It was his sixth novel. His first five might never see the light of day, or they might. They might get reworked. Those first five novels represent about a million practice words. Mistborn, which was his 14th novel, um, was his second novel in print. So a lot of people look at Brandon Sanderson's work and they, they read Mistborn and they think, wow, that's just a fantastic, that's a second novel? What a fantastic, not, that's not a second novel, it's a 14th novel from a guy who's been working at this for about 10 years because he really, really, really does not want to have a real job. <laughs> All right, and you hear Brandon speak, that's how he pitches it. He never wanted to have a real job and so he worked really hard at this. Um, next slide. Okay, isn't innate ability important? Well, of course it is. Of course it is. But, can you identify it? Can you identify it in others? Can you look at somebody else's work and say, you've got a gift? Can you really do that? Can you even do it to yourself? More importantly, can that identification, and now we're getting down to the brass tacks, can that identification predict exemplary career performance? Next slide. Innate ability versus your birthday. Let's talk about European, or not European, I think it's Canadian um, World Cup youth soccer players. Now, the study was Canadian, but yeah, it's World Cup. These are people who are under the age of 20 and who are playing as the best soccer players in their age group, you know, under 20, which is a pretty large group, in the world. The age group cutoff for youth soccer in most of these countries is August, which means if you're 10 years old and you're born in September, you are uh, the youngest kid on the team. If you're 10 years old and you're born in August, you're the oldest kid on the team. August birthday boys have a slight, slight statistical size advantage and maturity advantage. I mean, sit down with any group of eight-year-old kids and you can point at the ones who are about to turn nine, right? They're just a little bit bigger. And what's unfortunate for the littler kids is that coaches focus their training on the bigger kids because the coaches want to win. And so you take the kid who's a little bit larger and you say, hey, you're going to be my forward and here's the drills I want you working on. Everybody else, you guys are wings or whatever. You take another big kid and say, boy, you, you're my goalie. Wow, look at the reach on you. His reach is half an inch bigger than the kid standing next to him, but the coach knows that that's going to make, the coach believes, that's going to make a difference. And so the training advantage stacks over time. By the time these kids are 20, it doesn't matter if there was an innate physical gift. What matters is that they got the training over and over and over, and by the time they're 20, the size difference between the kid with the August birthday and the kid with the September birthday, they're almost a year apart. The size difference between those two is negligible. You can't even see it. But the training difference shows up in that graph right there. Is, now, is that interesting information? How many show interesting? Is that kind of cool? How many of you think that's tragic? It's, yeah. That's not fair. It shouldn't be based on your birthday. Next slide. Conclusion. If, if there is an innate ability factor to be found in youth soccer, it is statistically insignificant compared to the training. Those are very important words. Statistically insignificant. They don't mean it doesn't exist. They mean it's so small that it comes out in the wash. We, we can't measure it. We certainly can't predict it. This same principle has been shown across all kinds of other fields. Next slide. 